So in Matthew 7, we're closing out the sermon, the famous Sermon on the Mount. We had started in Matthew chapter 5 through chapter 6 and chapter 7. And the reason why I'm even mentioning that again is because as we get into chapter 7, we're going to go back and look at a little bit through, through chapter 6 just to see the common theme and to get everything in context. Because chapter 7 starts off with a verse that many, many people who are not even Christians love to yank out of context and just tell you that you're a Christian and you should not judge. And they'll say, well, the Bible says judge not. It says judge not. I mean, the Bible says judge not. So who do you think you are to judge? Right. Now, <laughs> there's many things that are interesting. We're going to get into that. And, and God's word is perfect and true. And the reason why these people, you know, I, it never bothers me when unsaved people try to tell you what the Bible says because the Bible says that the natural man receiveth not the things of God. That this is a spiritually discerned book that you need the Holy Ghost and the Spirit to guide you into all truth and wisdom through God's Word. And as an unsaved person, they're not going to get it. They don't understand it at all. And it's really interesting. I mean, I have the testimony. I'm sure many others here would probably raise their hand the same thing. Now, if you got saved real young, you might not know it or, or realize the difference. But I know when I would try reading the Bible before I was saved, just it's confusing. I didn't really know. I mean, you could read it. Obviously, you could read with some level of comprehension in the English language, right? I'm not just saying it was a foreign language. But just the level of understanding of what it's even talking about, It's really hard to really hard to understand, but then it's just like the like the day after I got saved, or the day you got saved, right? Day after is when I would actually look at. I got saved at night, so I didn't really stay up later uh, after I got saved. So um, the next day, I was able to pick up the Bible and read it, and it's just amazing. It's like the scales are removed from your eyes, and and that's because when you get saved, you're born again, and the Holy Spirit resides inside of you. It's going to help you. Now, it doesn't mean you're going to perfectly understand every little thing about the Scripture and know all the ins and outs and just have that down, just, well, I know everything now. Of course not. You need to grow and learn. But that's going to open up your understanding to be able to learn and understand the Scripture at all. You've got to have that first. If you don't have that, then you're just the blind leading the blind, basically. So we start off in Matthew chapter 7. Verse number one says, judge not that ye be not judged. So even right off the bat, it's not just saying don't judge and you could never judge. The purpose to not judge is so that you are not judged. And then he clarifies this further and further as we get into the chapter. So it's not judge not, period, even though that's what so many people want to throw out there. Oh, judge not. Oh, your book says not to judge. Just read it, stupid. Don't just repeat things that you've heard other people say. And they always want to say, judge not. Why? When you preach against wickedness, when you preach against the sins of this world, they're going to say, oh, who are you to judge? Oh, you're not supposed to judge when you just call out sin for what it is. So basically what they're saying then is that you can't even quote Bible verses without expounding on them. Just plain old scripture. Be, oh, because you're judging. That, my friends, is ridiculous. Let's look into what this actually is saying and what it actually means in context. Without just looking at two words, let's look at all the words. Verse 1, judge not that ye be not judged, for, so it's explaining it further, for with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you Again, so what this is, is a warning to those that do judge that whatever judgment that you are going to judge on others, you better expect the same judgment to come back on you. So if you're going to judge people for any manner of sin, well, hey, if you do those same things, you better expect that judgment to come back on your own head. That's what this is saying. So he's say, basically saying, be careful when you judge. You know, judge not, because when you start judging other people, that judgment's going to come on you. It doesn't mean you can't judge other people, but just beware. Because whatever judgment you judge is going to come back to you. 
if you are found out to be a hypocrite. And that's the key to this passage. He's referring to people who are hypocrites. Because what does a hypocrite do? do? They say, but they do not. We have lots of examples of hypocrites, and we're going to go back and look at those. That's why I said we have to look at everything in context. Because Jesus was talking about hypocrites in Matthew chapter 6. Multiple times he brings up hypocrites. He's telling us what to do with the Sermon on the Mount. He's telling us how we should live. We should have high standards. This is what you need to do. You need to pray. You need to seek God. You need to do all these things. But don't be like the hypocrites. Don't be a hypocrite. And Matthew 7 just continues on. When Jesus was preaching the Sermon on the Mount, he didn't say, hold on a minute, I'm taking a break. This is chapter 7 now. Okay, let's start again. He's preaching a sermon. So it's all taken in context. Look at verse number three. The Bible says, And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye, thou hypocrite. First cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. Now, verses three through five follow up verses 1 and 2. 1 and 2 is talking about judgment. The reason why he's bringing up this example, this illustration of someone having a moat in their eye versus a beam in their eye is just further explaining what he's referring to about judging. So in this example of someone with a moat and someone with a beam, you got the person with the beam in their eye is judging the person with the moat in their eye. Right? They're casting a judgment on them, but they're a hypocrite because he has a big old beam sticking out of his eye and he's trying to correct the person that has just a little, a little tiny piece of wood in his eye, a little, a little moat, a little speck or whatever, right? A small, much, it's a grand scale. Now, I've heard this interpreted before as to say that, well, what this is saying is that since a moat and a beam are both made out of wood, that basically the wood is symbol symbolic of sin, so this person has sin and that person has sin, so you can't judge that person because, well, they both have sin. And they just downplay completely what this is actually saying. There's a reason why it has a beam and a moat. It doesn't say one person with a moat in their eye, another person with a moat in their eye, and, and you know, oh, no, you can't do that because you're being a hypocrite. One guy has a huge, I mean, nobody can have a beam in their eye. Okay? This is, this is language that's, that's illustrative and used on purpose to be a ridiculous thing because no one walks around with an entire beam sticking out of their eye. It's impossible. So the whole purpose is to show you there are people that judge that way. It would be as if they're walking around with just this huge big old beam sticking out of their eye trying to tell other people where they're wrong. That's what this is talking about. And this is pretty simple English to understand. You know, you need to rest and twist the scriptures to get it to mean something other then what it's just saying of between a beam and a moat. Oh, well, it's all just wood, so it's all just sin, so no sinner could ever say anything. Well, you know what? If you take that interpretation, then you've got a big problem with the rest of the Bible. Man. If you're going to say that this is telling you that you cannot judge any, because we're all sinners, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, then nobody would be able to make a judgment at all if that's what this is saying. You, then nobody can make any judgment. Yet, we're going to go there in a few minutes. Verse after verse after verse. Jesus Christ himself even saying to judge. Judging is not a sin. Judging is not wrong. But when you're judging hypocritically, yeah, you better watch out. Because that's wrong and it's going to come back on you. So you've got a person who's committing adultery and just getting plowed, getting wasted, committing adultery, telling someone who told a lie at work to cover themselves, oh man, I can't believe you. Do you know how bad that is? You know, and just start judging 
that guy, it's like, look, man, why don't you stop cheating on your wife <laughs> and get sober? Before you judge me because, you know, I, I tried getting the blame up. And look, they're both wrong, but they're not on the same scale at all. One is a greater magnitude than the other. And I'm not going to prove this, but if you just want to go ahead and read through Leviticus, Exodus, Deuteronomy, you'll see that there are different punishments for different crimes. You'll see that there are greater sins. You'll see that not all sin is equal. The Bible never says all sin is equal. Now, concerning our salvation, if you're going to try to trust the law, the Bible does talk about, you know, hey, if, you, if you've done one sin, it's just, I mean, you might as well just be guilty of all sin. Because if you're not perfect, then <laughs> you're, you're a transgressor of the law. And you're damned. But that's not to say all sin is the same or all sin is equal. The Bible does not teach that at all. And to twist this, even this parable, into saying, well, it's all just talking about sin. No, it's not. One person has a much greater sin than the other person, and the one person, the, the one with the greater sin is trying to judge. The Bible is saying, don't do that. But let's get this in context. Flip back to chapter 6. Because in, in Matthew 7, 5, it says, Thou hypocrite. And, and notice in Matthew 7, 5, Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye. Hey, take care of yourself first. Get that beam out of there. And then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the moat out of thy brother's eye. And, and think about this. When, when you judge somebody, the goal should be, and, and in this context, you've got a brother and a brother. I mean, he's talking about people who are saved. Hey, you, you've got, beholdest thou the moat that is in thy brother's eye, right? His brother. The guy with the beam has a brother with a moat in his eye. That's what the story says. When you judge someone, when you're judging your brother, you're telling them what they're doing is wrong, but the point is so that they could get right. Because they would, you know, the, that's why you tell someone that they're wrong, you rebuke them. You judge them, you're judging that, hey, what you're doing is wrong so that they can stop doing that and get right. That's why you don't want to do that hypocritically because you're going to end up just causing more problems than anything because why would anyone want to listen to you when you've got a big old beam in your eye? Don't even get close to me. You can't, tell, you can't help me get this little, this little speck out of my eye. You can't see clearly at all. And don't think that you can see clearly if you've got major sin in your life. You can't see clearly. If you could, you wouldn't be doing whatever it is that, that, that caused you to have a big beam in your eye. You obviously can't see clearly, so don't go nitpicking my life trying to help me out when, when you've got major problems. But once you take care of that, you get the big beam out of your eye, then you start seeing clearly. Now you will be able to help get the moat out of your brother's eye. So we see, when is it right then to start judging? Okay, well, yeah, you've got all this stuff straightened out and cleared up. Now you can. And he's not saying, well, because you had that beam in your eye, now you could never judge anyone on anything ever again because you had that beam. Well, now you just forget it. Just because someone even had a major sin in their life doesn't mean you could never judge anyone ever again. If you get right with God, you start living righteously, you start doing the right thing. Because again, look, we've all been sinners. It doesn't mean you could never, ever judge again because you might be guilty of something. It would be like saying, well, I can't preach against alcohol now because I was guilty of that sin. I was guilty of drunkenness, so I can't preach against it. Even though I haven't had a drop of alcohol in, I can't even tell you how many years now. I know exactly the day that I quit, but I've never touched it again since then. But now look, if I start, if I pick up the bottle again, you better believe I can't, be, I can't be preaching against that and judging other people for that. Not if I'm guilty of it. No way. And if, I, and if I'm guilty of that, then you, you got to throw me out of the pulpit. Because I'm also not qualified then to be telling you guys what's, what's right and wrong because there's no way I could see clearly. 
But that's the biblical way of dealing with things. But when you don't have those problems, when you don't have the big beam, then, yeah, you can judge. The whole point is hypocrisy. And this is, this is evident. Not only does it literally say it in this passage right in context, but Jesus has been talking about this all throughout, all throughout his sermon. Look at chapter 6, verse number 2. Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Verse number 5, And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Verse 16, Moreover, when ye fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. All in between, chapter 6, he's telling us what to do. He's saying fast. He's saying pray. He's saying, you know, do these things. Give alms. But don't be a hypocrite. In the same token, judge, but don't be a hypocrite. Amen. Jesus just pointed to all of these various types of people being hypocrites. Yet, if we were to say, hey, don't use vain repetitions like the Catholics do, you know what someone's going to say? You're judgmental. That's exactly what Jesus was saying. Are you going to call Jesus judgmental? Not the, I mean, not the way that these people are called. Is Jesus judgmental? Yeah, he is. He judges, but not in the way that these people are talking about. They're, they're, they're throwing around being judgmental as just being some, oh man, that's not very Christian. <laughs> so if you do the exact same thing that Jesus is, that's not very Christian. Because people don't like the way you judge other denominations. Oh, who are you to judge other denominations? We're all Christian. Jesus would want us all to come together. No, he wouldn't. He came to bring division and a sword. He divided the, the mother-in-law against the daughter-in-law and the daughter-in-law against the mother-in-law. The father against the son, the son against the father. Why? Because he cares about his doctrine. He cares about his word. And if, 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 if being for Christ separates even family members, then separate. Stick with Jesus. And if people aren't going to stick with Jesus, they can have their own church. But we're not going to yoke up with them. When it comes to judging, you don't have to, you don't have to if you want to turn to these places, you can. We'll read from John 7, then Luke 12, then 1 Corinthians 5, 1 Corinthians 11, just to, because there's a lot to cover in the sermon tonight, but I, mean, I really want to make sure I hit this point. As I mentioned previously, you know, if, if the Bible is just teaching here that we're just not supposed to judge, you've got a huge problem. I mean, this was, Jesus would be schizophrenic if he said, well, you're not supposed to judge. Well, hey, you're all sinners, so you can't judge. Then why in John chapter 7, I'm going to start reading verse number 22 to get it in context. The Bible reads, Moses therefore gave unto you circumcision, not because it is of Moses, but of the fathers. And ye on the Sabbath day circumcise a man. If a man on the Sabbath day receive circumcision, that the law of Moses should not be broken, are you angry at me? Because I have made a man every whit whole on the Sabbath day? Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. So what's he doing here? He's telling people how to judge. Isn't that what he was just doing in Matthew chapter 7, telling you how to judge? Well, don't be a hypocrite when you judge. He also says in, Matthew, in John chapter 7, hey, don't judge just according to appearance what things look like on the surface. Judge righteous judgment. In order to judge righteous judgment, you need to know a little bit more. He said, on the surface, it may look like he's breaking the Sabbath day. No, dig a little bit deeper. Look, Moses is allowed to cut away skin on the Sabbath day in order to keep the law, and he's not breaking the Sabbath. So you're going to look at me, who's making someone, who's actually healing somebody, and say that I'm breaking the Sabbath? That's what he's talking about in judging righteous judgment. Why? Because he was being judged unrighteously. They were trying to bring blame on him, saying that he was breaking the law of Moses when he wasn't. By healing was not breaking the law. He's saying that's not a righteous judgment. Because it is lawful to heal on the Sabbath days. 
So he's telling you how to, that's why he wouldn't say, he didn't say, hey, judge not according to appearance and don't judge at all. He would have had to if Matthew 7 is just saying you can't judge at all. But it's not. That's why he said judge righteous judgment. That's why Matthew 7, judge without being a hypocrite. Luke chapter 12. Again, Jesus Christ talking about this. Luke 12 verse 54. And he said also to the people, when ye see a cloud rise out of the west, straightway ye say, there cometh a shower. And so it is. And when ye see the south wind blow, ye say, there will be heat. And it cometh to pass. Ye hypocrites. Well, look, at there's that word again, hypocrites. You can discern the face of the sky and, the, and of the earth, but how is it that you do not discern this time? Yea, and why even of yourselves judge ye not what is right? Now he's saying, why don't you judge what is right? Why aren't you judging righteously? And he's calling them hypocrites. Hey, you can look outside, you can figure out if it's going to rain or not tomorrow. You can look around and see you, you have that knowledge, but you can't even discern this time when Jesus is walking around performing miracles, preaching the gospel of the lost. You can't discern this. Hey, judge righteous judgment. Why can't you judge what is right? Those are the words of Jesus. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, because, you know, people want to say, oh, well, that's Paul and this is Jesus. Look, it's all the word of God. Amen. It's all Jesus. It's all the Word of God. Whether it's literally coming out of Jesus Christ's mouth as he was physically on this earth, or whether it's coming out of the Apostle Paul's mouth, they're all words of the Holy Ghost. It's all the same author. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, of course, we have this entire section of, of, of Scripture talking about who we're not to even keep company with. Yeah, if you're saying I'm not allowed to go out and eat lunch with you, I think that's judging. I'm not allowed to eat with you because of what you're doing, because of this sin that you're in. Oh, you're so judgmental. I'm following the scripture. 1 Corinthians 5, verse number 9. I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators. <gasps> but love is love. Don't you judge those fornicators just because they don't want to get married. Who are you to judge those fornicators? They're in love. Who are you to say what they can and can't do? You're so judgmental. That's not very Christ-like. Christ would have sat with all of them and had a, a big gathering and invited them all into his church. No, Christ went and preached the gospel to them, and that's what we're going to do too. But we're not going to go and just yoke up with them. Verse 10, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or with the dollars, for then you must needs go out of the world. He said, I'm not even talking about the people out in the world. I'm talking about within the church. Verse number 11, but now have I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man is called a brother, be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner. With such an one, no, not to eat. You have standards. How are you going to know whether or not you should eat with somebody that's called a brother? You have to judge them. Because if they're doing any of these things, if they're a fornicator, or if they're covetous, or if they're an idolater, or if they're a railer, or if they're a drunkard, you're not going to go eat with them. You have to judge whether or not they are those things. Because if they are, sorry, can't eat with you. Because I love God more. And that's what the Bible tells me to do. Verse 12, For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within? He's saying, don't you judge them? Oh, Christian! New Testament Christian! Aren't you judging them that are within? Right. Yeah. Oh, that's a, that's a judgmental church. Well, amen. You know what? Because a lot of churches these days are not judgmental. They're not obeying 1 Corinthians chapter 5. They're saying, everybody welcome. Oh, yeah, that old Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, that's, we don't need to worry about that. That was just Paul going a little bit extreme. Jesus said, judge not. That's what we're seeing today. 
We have an epistle showing us how we're supposed to be in church. And he's saying, aren't you judging them that are within? But them that are without God judgeth. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. Paul's judging the person that does these things as being wicked. Amen. That's a wicked person. That's a judgment. He's saying, put that person away from you. They're wicked. How about 1 Corinthians chapter 11? Same book. A few chapters later, chapter 11, verse number 13. Judge in yourselves. Is it comely that a woman pray unto God uncovered? Doth not, doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. Sounds like more judgments. He's telling you, judge in yourself. You judge. Judge for yourself. There's nothing wrong with the word judge. There's nothing wrong with judging unless you're being a hypocrite about it, unless you're judging unrighteously, unless you're perverting judgment, then it's wrong. Absolutely it's wrong. But let's get what the passage is actually saying and not go overboard with it because we've got a bunch of snowflakes that don't like hearing the truth, that don't like hearing judgment on what they're doing. Amen. They don't like hearing that, oh, fornication's wrong, maybe I shouldn't be doing that. Oh, sodomy is a sick, disgusting, vile perversion. Maybe we should say that's exactly what it is. Which brings me to my next point. Look at our next verse in Matthew chapter 7. Look at verse number 6. Because we just had all these verses about judging, right? In Matthew 7. He's talking about the hypocrite with the beam in his eye. And then we get to verse number 6. It says, Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, Neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. You go, wow, that's kind of an interesting transition. It almost seems out of place. I mean, he's just talking about a guy judging him and being in his eye, and all of a sudden he's talking about dogs and swine and, and giving holy stuff to them. What does that have to do with judging? It's not out of place at all. We actually see an example of what this is referring to in Genesis chapter 19. Dogs and swine are beasts. These are animals that are going to, he's saying that they're going to turn on you and rend you. Basically, you're trying to offer something good, something holy unto beasts, unto these filthy animals. Don't do it because they're just going to turn around and try to destroy you. Basically, don't even bother trying to help them get the beam out of their eye. You're able to see clearly. You don't have a beam in your eye, and you're going to go and offer something holy, the Word of God, and say, hey, you guys got this big old beam in your eye. You need to get that beam out. He's saying, don't do that with the swine and with the dog. Don't cast that which is holy then, because they're going to turn around and rend you. This is why we don't go out to the sodomite parades and try to win them to Christ, right, because they're just a bunch of dogs. Right, and I'm not going to cast that which is holy before dogs. All it's going to do is just make them angry and turn around and then try to rend you. This isn't out of place at all. And Genesis chapter 19, the story of Sodom and Gomorrah proves this perfectly because we see the attitude of the Sodomite, which is also referred to as dogs in Scripture. When men lie with men, they're referred to as dogs in multiple places in Scripture. Verse number 7 in Genesis 19. This is Lot speaking to the crowd that's gathered around his house and said, hey, bring out those men that we may know them. I pray you, brethren, do not so wickedly. So he's pleading with them, don't do so wickedly. What's he doing? He's judging them. Because what they want to do is wicked. Is that a judgment? Yes, it is. Is it an unrighteous judgment? Absolutely not. It lines up exactly with what God's word says. That is wicked. And then he offers them his two daughters in verse number eight. Look at verse number nine. And they said, so they answer him after he says, hey, don't do so wickedly. They said, stand back. And they said again, this one fellow came in to sojourn and he will needs be a judge. Sojourn just means he's staying there temporarily. Oh yeah, this guy just came in temporarily to stay here. Oh, and now he's going to be a judge over us. 
Who are you to judge, Lot? Notice the attitude? And notice who's saying it. The people were going, well, who are you to judge? It's the wicked Sodomites. Amen. Yet today we have Christians saying, well, who are you to judge? Amen. It's twisted and it's backwards. They got the spirit of Sodom in them. Right. Who are you to judge? Yeah. It's the same wicked people that rejected Moses, too. Yeah. Well, who made you a judge over us? Well, you know who made him a judge? God made him a judge over you. Yeah. So, yeah, this verse fits in just perfectly. Don't cast your pearl before swine, because they're just going to turn around and rend you, just like with, with Lot. They said, oh, he's going to need to be a judge. Now will we deal worse with thee than with them? Right. He's trying to get the mode out of their eye, get the beam out of their eye. He's casting pearl before swine, and they're turning around going and trying to rend him. It's yep. exactly what's happening in this passage. We've got the judgment. We've got the, the, the wicked people, the dogs. It's about judging. It's what it's about. Let's continue on to Matthew 7. Go back to Matthew chapter 7, verse number 7. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. This is an awesome passage. We're going to continue on with more, excuse me, in the next few verses. But what a great promise. He's saying, you know what? Just ask. It'll be given to you. See, you seek. You'll find it. You come to the door and knock. God's going to open up that door for you. That's a great problem. I mean, this is, this, is, this is real comforting to know this. Now, what's interesting, I had someone in, uh, in Arizona knock on my door. It was a Jehovah's Witness. And it was like two boys and a dad or something like that. And I let the boy say what, what he wanted to say. Because he was real nervous and stuff. So I let him say what he wanted to say, and, and it kind of blew me away because I don't spend much time in the New World Translation trying to see where they're all wrong, because they're wrong everywhere. I mean, you just open up to any page, you're going to see how ridiculous their, their, their so-called Bible is. But this kind of blew me away that it said this. This is what it says for this passage, verses 7 and 8. It says, keep on asking, and it will be given you. Keep on seeking, and you will find. Keep on knocking, and it will be opened to you. For everyone asking receives and everyone seeking finds and everyone knocking it will be open they take such a simple passage and it's like well you have to keep on knocking you have to keep doing it and 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 if you don't stop then it'll be opened and this is i mean th their workspace salvation is so embedded in all of their translation which is why they have their own bible and, I, and it kind of saddened me because it was a little boy. But I said, well, hold on a second. Do you know what that verse really says? Here, hold on. And I grabbed my Bible and I showed him and tried giving him the gospel. Now, his dad wasn't having it and they took off, but you know, at least he had, he had that one opportunity to hear. No, he says, you knock and it's open to you. You seek, you'll find it. You ask. You, see, you ask one time. You have to just ask and 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 ask over and over and over and over and over again. Definitely not for salvation. Verse number nine, we continue with the same thought, the same, the same concept. Or what man is there of you whom if his son ask bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? If ye then being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more Shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him? So these are, first of all, there's nothing wrong with what he's giving. He's listing here as things that are being asked for by a child, right? You're asking for food. Hey, can I have a fish? Can I have some bread? And he's saying, what father is there out there when their child comes to them hungry and asking for food is going to give them a rock? They're going to give them a stone. Here, kid, have that. No, no dad's going to do that. 
No, no loving dad, that's for sure. And he's saying, and you guys are all sinners. You guys are evil. If you know how to give good gifts, how much more your Father in heaven? And again, man, what a, what a great analogy. You go to God, you ask God for good things. You better believe he's going to give you those good things that, that you're asking for. Good things that are according to his will. Good things that are, that are righteous. Goodness. You ask for good things. This is, this is what he's saying. This is literally what the verse is. Pray. Because that's what praying means to ask. Don't forget to pray. It's a great hymn, but take that hymn to heart. Go home and pray. Pray for yourself. Don't be ashamed to pray for things for yourself. Pray for others, absolutely. But pray for yourself. Pray, ask God for the, you know, the good things. We've got a great promise here. We've got a heavenly Father. Verse number 12, Therefore all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. Now this is known as the golden rule, right? You treat others the way you want to be treated. It just kind of summarizes that. We say, well, how is that the law and the prophets? Well, it's very simple. And it's a very simple kind. And what he's, what he's doing is just encapsulating everything about the law that has to do with man. In, in this phrase, you know, whatsoever you would that men would do, should do to you, you do, do ye even so to them. Whatever you want people to do to you, when you want people to do nice things to you, well, why don't you start by doing nice things to them? You want people to forgive you, well, why don't you forgive them? You want people, you know, how do you want people to treat you? That's how you treat them. It's very simple. So how does that, how does that tie in with the law and the prophets? Well, do you want people to murder you? No, well, then don't murder them. Do you want people to steal from you? Then don't steal from them. Do you want people to commit adultery with your wife? Then don't commit adultery with their wife. Do you know I mean? Very simple, right? I don't want any of that stuff happening to me. Then don't do it to anyone else. Do you want people lying through their teeth to you? Then don't lie to them. Very simple. And, and ultimately, you could look at the whole law reflecting that. Verse number 13, enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Now, what a great path. There's so many things you could go into here, but what this is teaching, obviously, is that the way to hell, the way to destruction, there's a lot of people that are going that route. And there's going to be a lot of people that end up in hell. And the way to life is narrow. There's not many paths all just leading in this big gate. Because it says straight is the gate. Now, it doesn't say straight as in S-T-R-A-I-G-H. T, like if you draw a line, like this is a straight line. And this is where people get confused and, and you have people trying to teach work salvation. You got to walk the straight and narrow, right? And what, the, what they imply by that, or what they mean by that is saying, well, when you sin, you're turning to the left hand or the right hand. So you just got to stay on the, right, on, the, on the straight and narrow path and do what's right. And that's how you're going to make it into heaven because you're doing what's right, because you're obeying the commandments. It's not what that's talking about. When it says straight, it just, it literally is restating narrow. So instead of saying, because the gate is narrow and the way is narrow, that doesn't sound as good as saying straight is the gate, it kind of, kind of rhymes, and narrow is the way. So the way would be the path. That's narrow and the gate is narrow because it's about as big for Jesus Christ to be standing there because that's the way through it. He is the way, the truth, and the life. That's why it's narrow, because it's exclusive. It's only through Jesus Christ. Right. It's not like, well, you could take this door through Buddha. You could take this door through Muhammad. You could take that door through, you know, whatever, through atheism. And, but it's all going to lead to the same place. No. It's very narrow. It's very exclusive. It's only through Jesus Christ. 
Oh man, saying there's many people going to hell? Sounds pretty judgmental to me. <laughs> it's in the same passage. He's saying many people are going into destruction. Few people, few are saved. Not because there's only a few people that are really, really, really good at obeying the law. Everyone's a sinner. It's because not many people choose to accept the free gift of eternal life. That's it. Because people can't let go of their own righteousness for their salvation. They just cannot get over the fact that, no, you really have no part in this. Oh, that's too easy. You mean I just have to believe? Well, what about those? So you're telling me the person that goes out and has killed five people that they get to go to heaven? Yeah. Yeah. And they are going to go to heaven if they put their faith in Jesus Christ. And you won't with your proud heart and your proud attitude because you think that you're so righteous that you're so much better than they are and that you're going to make it into heaven based on your own works. You're going to go straight into hell. It's not by works of righteousness. Let's keep reading here, verse number 15. Man, there's so much in this chapter. I'm really trying my best to get through all this without spending too much time in any one place. Chapter 15, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. Now, <laughs> I don't know why, Matthew chapter 7 specifically has so much false doctrine just, just that people abuse Matthew 7. Because we're not even done. There's, there's one more place that people still want to abuse with their work, salvation, and everything else. But Matthew chapter 7 here in this passage, how many people have ever heard before, well, how do you know if someone's saved? You know it by their fruits. Yeah. This is a common teaching that people say, oh, yeah, if you want to know if someone's saved, you've got to look at their fruits. You've got to look at their works. Oh, well, that, I mean, there's no way that person's saved. Look at they, they didn't quit drinking booze. They're not saved. Oh, they're not going to church. Yeah, maybe they went for a couple months, and now they're out of church, and it, they were never saved to begin with. They're not saved. And they say, well, you're going to know them by their fruits. Read what the passage says. Yeah, in, in verse number 20, wherefore by their fruits you shall know. So there are some people we're going to know by their fruits. First of all, we have to understand what fruits is. And second of all, we have to know who them is. Let's look at them first. Because if we're going to read the passage, we're going to read it in context. Wherefore by their fruits you shall know them. Who's them? Well, verse 19 is talking about trees. Verse 18 is talking about tree. Verse 17 is talking about a tree. Verse 16, ye shall know them by, oh, there's them again. Well, let's see what comes before verse 16. How about verse number 15? Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Oh, so the them is false prophets. Does it say you're going to know every Christian by their fruits? Does it say you're going to know every unbeliever by their fruits? No. Is every unbeliever a false prophet? No. A false prophet is a wolf on the inside. A wolf is out to seek and to destroy and to scatter and, and to cause destruction. And they're putting on a sheep's garment. They're hiding. They're covering up the fact that they're a wolf. They're not out in the open about it. They are coming in intentionally to try to get in among the flock and cause as much destruction as they can. That's a wicked person. That's a reprobate. That's a false prophet. And the Bible's teaching us, you're going to know these people that put on the fancy clothing, that have the nice big smile, that say, hey, brother, hey, sister, and use all the spiritual talk, and they'll have a Bible in their hand, and they'll try to say things that sound nice, but inside, they are wolves, and they're looking to destroy. And he's saying, you're going to know them by their fruits. 
And he takes the time to say, well, hey, do you gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Do you go and get like good fruit from, from bramble bushes and things that don't produce anything good but are just full of sticklers and stickers and thorns and, and you know, no. You don't go to that. You go to, you want an apple? You go to an apple tree. You're not going to go to a fern tree and try to get some kind of fruit off of you. You know, you, you want the type of, you want a good fruit, something you could eat, something that's good for you. You're going to go to that type of tree. So the same way that a tree is only going to bring forth whatever type of tree it is, you can't expect a banana to grow out of an apple tree. It's the same way with prophets. With prophets. You have good prophets, real prophets, and you have false prophets. A prophet is going to bring forth fruit. Well, the tree reproduces by bringing forth fruit. That's how more trees grow. It's their reproduction. Prophets reproduce. And it's not talking about being a man and physically reproducing like with your wife. It's talking about bringing forth converts, bringing forth other people that believe like you do, bringing forth other people. That's who you're going to know, how you're going to know the false prophet versus the real prophet. You could judge them by their fruits, by their converts. Who are they winning over? What do they believe? That's how you're going to know uh, who they are. Think about a, um, and that's why it says here, you know, every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. And, you know, some people say, well, yeah, I know now he's preaching his false gospel, but he got a lot of people saved before, and now he's just kind of screwed up on it. Look, if they're a false prophet, they never brought forth good fruit because that's not the type of tree they are. They didn't switch into being a different tree. Once you start producing fruit, once you bring, start bringing forth children unto the devil, because you're a child of the devil yourself, you don't all of a sudden become a child of God. You already have a father. Your father is the devil. You are already spiritually born into Satan's family, not into God's family. Done. And the, the, the false prophets, they cannot bring forth any... So when you have a, a church and you've got this big prophet, right? And you go to ask the people of his church if they're saved, if you know, if the, and nobody's saved. Well, there's the fruit. Amen. Amen. That's it. That's how you know. Amen. The false prophet could be saying the right things because he's a deceiver. But the, that's why the way that you tell isn't going to be, well, he says this. He says salvation's by grace through faith, and it's not of works. Yeah, that's true. But what does everybody in the congregation believe? Yeah. Yeah. That's good. What, are the what do his converts believe? Yeah. Wow, none of them believe that it's not of works. They all think you've got to do something good. Well, that shows me the fruit. On the flip side, you've got someone, a prophet, preaching the word of God. Well, wow. The vast majority of people in the congregation are saved. His converts, the people that he led to Christ, I go and talk to them. They're solid. They're, they're right on. It's good fruit. That's how you know it. That's why even the Apostle Paul said to Timothy, you know, make full proof of thy ministry. That other people can see. It's, it's, you, know, you do the works, you make full proof of it. Fruit inspection isn't looking at the individual's life. It's looking at the fruit, looking at the converts. It's not a hard concept. I don't know why people have such a hard time with that, but let's keep reading here. Verse 21. And he follows this up with, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter in the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Another verse that works salvation crowd is going to love to just take out of context. Right? Because if we just look at this verse, and if that's all we had to go off of, well, he that doeth the will of my Father... That's how we're going to enter the kingdom of heaven. That sounds like work salvation to me. I mean, if, you, if that's all you have to go off of, that's what it does sound like that, right? Because you're doing the will. Well, isn't the will of the Father to, to go to church and to, 
you know, do good things. Like, that's God's will, isn't it? Well, let's read the next verse. Look at verse number 22. Many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have not we, have not, have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name have cast out devils and in thy name done many wonderful works? So he's listing off all these things. Now, prophesying in the name of the Lord, would that be the will of the Lord? Sure. Casting out devils. Yeah. Wonderful works. Yeah, God wants us to do wonderful works, right? That's God's will. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me that work iniquity. Well, then maybe, I mean, if, that, if, if that's what happens, maybe he meant something different when he said, he that doeth the will of my father. Don't you think <laughs> that he wasn't referring to the works? Because they just said the works. If you had to do the works in order to keep the will of the Father to go to heaven, and they're saying, we did the works, and he's casting them to hell, obviously, he means something else when he says, he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Because you know what the will of the Father is, which is in heaven, for us to be saved? is to believe on Lord Jesus Christ. That's the will of God. That's what God wants us to do to be saved. He wants you to put your faith in Jesus Christ. And these people were trusting their works. I, it's funny how many times I've had people say, well, Matthew 7 says that you got to do the works. I go, really? That's funny because I was just going to turn to Matthew chapter 7 to show you why it's not of works. Come here, let's take a look at that. I, I mean, it's happened to me. I don't know how many times. I've literally had, I, I was literally going to turn to Matthew chapter 7. I was on my way there when someone brought up Matthew 7. Is it the Bible says, Lord, Lord? Yeah, it does. <laughs> Let me show you something. <laughs> because he says, I never knew you. You can't say, oh, well, they were doing these works, but it wasn't enough. They weren't following. No, he never knew them. He didn't say, I used to know you. Well, I knew you once, but then you stopped doing the works, and, and now I don't know you anymore. I never knew you. So the entire time, they're prophesying in the name of the Lord. They're casting out devils. The entire time, they're doing many wonderful works. He said, I never knew you. Why? Because that's what they're trusting in. Because they're not believing in Christ. They're not trusting in Christ only. Look, if I were to be standing face to face with God, the Father, and he said, why should I let you into heaven? Whatever I tell him, that's what I'm believing in. That's what my faith is in. My answer. What am I trusting to, be, to get in heaven? Why should I let you in heaven? Uh, whatever I say, there's where my faith lies. These people are in that situation. God, we prophesy in your name. We've cast out devils. We've done all these works. Why shall I let you in heaven? We've done all these works. <laughs> Depart from me. I never knew you. I never knew you. People spend their entire life thinking that, oh man, I've been doing all this work. I've been serving God. Finally, I'm going to get to go to heaven. And he's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. Because they didn't get saved. Because they didn't put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 24, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell not for it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. If we're not built upon Jesus Christ, he's the rock, then we won't stand in the trying times. We can't stand. We need to build our house. We need to build our salvation on Jesus Christ. That's the only thing that's going to stand. Anything else 
is going to be destroyed and great is the destruction. You think you're going to build it on your own works, on your own concrete, on your own cement, on your own whatever it is that you think is firm and it's going to hold you up? If it ain't Jesus, it ain't going to hold. It says, you're a foolish man. Verse 28, And it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine. Said, wow. They couldn't believe it. I mean, imagine just hearing all this truth. Just for the first time, we get the luxury of being able to memorize this stuff because we've had it and just been our fingertips and he's read it over and over and over again. And they're just, they're hearing this stuff. And they've been used to the scribes and the Pharisees and, you know, giving their little Catholic sermons or whatever, Jewish, you know, teaching their Jewish fables and, you know, being big old hypocrites. They hear Jesus, they're astonished. Wow. He says, For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. <laughs> this isn't like the scribes. He's teaching them and he's just telling them exactly like it is. I mean, there is no doubt in what he's saying. He's just full on saying, that, you know, don't be like these hypocrites. You need to do this. And you've heard the law say this, but I said this. I said, you know, don't even look on a woman to lust after her in your heart. Whoa. That's the preaching of Jesus. There's power. We need the churches to stop butchering the Word of God and preach it for what it says and don't stop after two words of Matthew chapter 7. Read it all. Preach it all. Preach it as one as authority and not, oh, well, we don't want to offend anybody and we shouldn't judge anybody. Look, Jesus made people pretty upset. He made them so upset that they crucified him. Jesus judged the works of this world that they're wicked. Jesus judged people all the time. Look at how he, how he called out the Pharisees, the scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. He said they're full of dead men's bones. He's calling people names. He called Herod a fox, okay? He's judging people. But you know why he's not sinning? Because it's righteous judgment. Because he's not a hypocrite. Because he doesn't have a beam in his own eye. Yet the same people say, well, Jesus is our example. Then let him be the example. Why don't you do what he does? He judged. Uh, uh, but, uh, uh. Are you saying not follow Jesus then? Yeah, they, they, they want to follow Jesus except when they have to pick up their cross and follow him. Yeah. Then all of a sudden, they're like the rich ruler. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, okay, forget it then. Right? Don't want to have nothing to do with that. But they'll tell you to follow him. Yeah. Hypocrites. Don't tell me to follow Jesus and pick up my cross if you're not willing to do the same thing. Right. Amen. Amen. Let's bow as I have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for... Um, for that great sermon that we just finished up uh, in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Lord, we thank you for giving us the truth. I pray that you please embolden us and help us to, um, to understand more of your words, to preach your words, and to, to have good judgment, Lord. I pray, I pray that you would please help us have clarity of mind regarding your law and understanding, God. I pray that you please help us to get the sin out of our own lives so that we wouldn't be the ones with beams in our eyes judging other people. Lord, help us to... to Take a step back if, if, you know, if we're in a situation and, uh, and not judge. If, if, if someone's got a beam in their eye, dear Lord, I pray that you would please just, uh, just help them to get it out and, and that you would use other people who can see clearly to help that, that person out, Lord, and, um, and help us to just discern uh, how we ought to be judging. And, and I pray that you would please just bless our church. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.